Hello, I'm Vivi Price. I'm the editor of NewMexicoMercury.com. I'm here today with one of the good guys in the legislature, uh, who's in the Mercury Library on Insight New Mexico, a uh, longtime Democratic State Senator, Cisco McSorley, who's been in the Senate from District 16 for 17 years, since 1997, and has served in the New Mexico House of Representatives uh, for a dozen years, from 1984 to 1986. Um, he has uh, a fantastic environmental voting record. I think it's, I think it's a hundred percent or ninety-nine percent from, from the New Mexico Voters Alliance. He's um, a longtime supporter of uh, the legalization of medical, of medical cannabis, um, which some of us like to call pot. Uh, he supports um, LGBT uh, uh, equality in New Mexico. He's he's been um, a big gun and heavy supporter of, of raising uh, the minimum wage. Uh, he's been a long time, long time advocate of UNM and, and uh, the tremendous intellectual and economic possibilities of that institution. So it's a, it's a great honor and a real pleasure to have, uh, to have you with us today, Cisco. So thank you. It's a wonderful pleasure to be here and an honor. I've uh, followed the Mercury as long as you've had it and uh, Believe me, it's a breath of fresh air in New Mexico to have people speaking to the truth. Well, we know that uh, that you have, uh, as do I, a particular view of the of, of the major news media in New Mexico, i.e., the Albuquerque Journal, uh, um, and the, of course, and also I think a probably different view of Santa Fe, New Mexico, which has become a great newspaper in my judgment. But I'd love you to talk a little bit about uh, your view of the journal and what it has what it has done to political coverage in New Mexico. And, and maybe you could sort of, um, maybe you sort of give an example, like possibly the downs of, um, of Albuquerque uh, uh, deal. Yeah, I've uh, taken this view of the journal really from Mark Twain, who said, you know, if you don't read a newspaper, you might be uh, ill-informed, but if you read the journal, you're going to be misinformed. <laughs> and... Um, it's really sad what's happened because there's this dichotomy between some of the wonderful work being done by their reporters yeah. and what actually makes it into the newspaper and on, onto their headlines and what they choose to cover. Um, it's a sad and it's an it's an, the obvious downfall was the loss of the Tribune. Once the Tribune was gone, no holes barred. There was no reason for the journal to hang on. And yet the effect is interesting because it's now pretty clear with their weekly distribution below 100,000. Nobody's reading it. Um, I'm not sure how much influence they have anymore wow. because of the ridiculous positions they've taken. Let me make it for instance. On last Sunday's newspaper, they had a long front page article by Tom Cole, their hitman, about the Democrats working uh, with their PACs. The irony about the whole article, which was never mentioned in the article, is all campaign reform done in New Mexico has been done with Democratic votes, and the Republicans have always opposed all of it. And so we haven't gotten the strong campaign reform that the Democrats want, and we have to live with what we have. And so Tom Cole never points out that the lack of reform is all due to the Republicans' <laughs> opposition and that everything the Democrats are doing is exactly what the Republicans are doing, except he went one step further. He actually said the Republicans aren't doing any of this, which is totally contrary to the facts that are easily discernible from the Secretary of State's webpage about who is giving what money to whom and where that money ends up. So he just won't state the big issue of what's going on, and then he misrepresents the facts. The other heartbreaking example, of course, is the Downs. Here we have acres and acres and acres of prime land in the heart of Albuquerque that could have done interesting and exciting things for this city. And what does this governor come in and do? She signs a multi-decade lease with a group of of people who want to gamble, who want to bring gambling to New Mexico. And she does this without ever having the land appraised. What New Mexican would sell their car or rent their property or 
do any business without appraising what the property is worth. And here we have taxpayer-owned property that's being given away on a multi-million dollar deal. And the irony about it is the terms of the deal were almost exactly the same terms as were the land was leased for in 1988. And so... And since 1988, the Downs has been a lousy tenant. They haven't paid all the money that they needed to pay. They hadn't done the repairs that needed to be done. And yet this administration came in and showed how they were going to do what they were going to do regardless of the facts. And the interesting thing about it is the Journal has never held them accountable for this. They've had one article, mostly based on information that received that they received from the national press, who has been far more uh, interested in getting to the facts than this local newspaper. So the irony about what we have in New Mexico is we have a better reformed, informed electorate outside the state of New Mexico as to what's happening here than the people of the state of New Mexico. <laughs> here we have New Mexicans being held hostage by local media as to what's going on in its state government and local government too. And, and let me just say, what local newspaper would allow a mayor with a crisis that we have, the dimensions we have about our police force, never conducting public dialogue? When was the last time this mayor had a publicly announced, with notice, in the newspaper, gosh, what a idea of putting it in the newspaper, where the general public could come and sound off. It's like the cowardice of, of the local politicians is beyond belief that they can't even face the public that, that they're elected to represent and whose best interests they're elected to represent. And we don't get that, and our local, and our local press has deemed that to be an acceptable way to govern in New Mexico now. So we started to talk a little bit about uh, this primary and about the curious uh, pronouncement. I guess it really wasn't a news release or anything. It was sort of overheard that the uh, Democratic National Governors Association was gonna, wasn't going to put any money in this race. And you had some interesting things to say about voter suppression and about, about national Democrats and where they're having to put their money. I'd like you to... to Talk about that a little bit to our audience, too, if you would. The National Democrats are actually in a very bad situation based on the money that flowed into the political process after the Supreme Court decision in 2010 um, called Citizens United. Republicans took over legislatures and they took over governorships in time to redistrict. And their gerrymandering was so pronounced that now statisticians tell us that any Democrat on a national level has to win 56% of the vote in most purple states for those purple states to actually have a legislature and a congressional delegation that is reflective of the overall vote. Sure. For instance, in 2012, um, Barack Obama won Pennsylvania, yet the Pennsylvania legislature and congr congressional um, delegation is overwhelmingly Republican. Why is that? It's because the Democrats were compacted into smaller and smaller districts, into uh, fewer and fewer districts, and the Republicans were able to stretch themselves out. It's called packing and cracking in the in the parlance of the, those on the inside. And that's basically what they did. And this Supreme Court has said redistricting is political. The irony, of course, about it in New Mexico is we had a judge come in and say, even though the New Mexico legislature had followed the law and did everything the Supreme Court told us we had to do, he used his own decision-making process to make us meet a standard that nowhere else in the nation did anybody have to meet. And so we are now possibly in a dangerous situation in New Mexico because of that. So basically, the Democrats are having to spend way too much money nationally uh, and in big states than, than they actually have to spend. And so they're going to sort of, sort of, sort of jet, uh, jettison us. Uh. Well, 
ironically, that's what it looked like initially, because the journal had so protected the governor. Every time the governor did a poll that that she could claim her support was at 66%, the journal would publish it. Yet they never published any of the other polls saying she's way below that. And so many in the national press couldn't see a path to victory in New Mexico. But now that more and more polling is being done, none of which you can read in the journal, but what you can read on the national blogs is showing that the race is actually much, much closer than anybody had originally thought it was. And now the national people are taking a second look at New Mexico. Good, good, good. But above and beyond all else, we have to win this race in New Mexico. And there's four things. We have to get New Mexico citizens to open their pocketbook and give five, 10, 15, 20, $50. We have to get New Mexicans registered. We have to get New Mexicans out to the polls. And if we don't do any of this, then we're going to lose. And so it is up to us. And so me, I'm looking forward to the fight. And then I've already got a plan that I'm going to be conducting to try to work on house seats. I personally am not up, but that doesn't mean I'm going to not be doing door to door for a lot of my friends in the legislature. So this, this primary really looks to be a kind of a, it's not a, not an actual do or die. We're not going to die, but to go through another four years of this, uh, we're going to get, if it's possible, to get any lower than 50, than 50th place in job in job growth. If it's possible to get any lower than actually losing more and more jobs, we're going to do that. If it's possible to be lower in education and lower in child welfare than last place, I guess I guess we'll get there <laughs> somehow if if we don't if we don't win this thing. What do you think um, the gubernatorial primary uh, did? for our chances to win this election, one. And uh, do you think that, um, that the Attorney General, Gary King, has a fighting chance here? And I don't mean you to be, yes, of course he has a fighting chance, but what do you think, what does he have to do to win this thing, to grab this thing and take it away from him? VB, that is the question <laughs> of the day. So let me start with what I thought of the primary. You know, it was the kind of primary where you have a well-known politician with lots of name ID in a low information race because there's not a lot of money flowing through it, and name ID won. And if you look at how Gary King won, he got a huge amount of votes in the north, he actually did okay on the east side, and he did well up and down the Rio Grande quarter. If he can do as correspondingly well in the general, he really has a very good chance. In uh -huh. fact, uh -huh. I've seen polling with the governor below 50% in a race against King. Okay. Now, the interesting thing about what's happened since the primary is the governor has spent millions of dollars on commercials, and one of which I think is incredibly ironic. She's actually telling everybody how bad the New Mexico economy is. And then she's, <laughs> you know, what she has denied for four years and tried to claim. And you know, the interesting thing about this governor is, when you can't win on the facts, you have to live by anecdotes. So whenever you listen to a governor's speech, she's always telling you an anecdote about how one business or one school is doing great when we know that the business community and the schools are collapsing around us. So she's been running with anecdotes. Now in her commercials, she's out there telling everybody how bad the economy is. But She'd have to be Houdini to get New Mexicans to believe that the reason the economy is so bad is because we have an attorney general that won't run the economy right. No attorney general is, is in charge of the economy. <laughs> so for her to do this is bizarre. And she is, in fact, opening the door. Now that she's passed the Rubicon of saying, oh, yeah, the economy is in the tank. Now all we need to do is make sure the general public understands why it's in the tank. So if you were to, uh, to put together, uh, uh, this is kind of my scenario too, if, you're, if you were to put together the North, if, you, if, he, if, if the Attorney General wins uh, Bernalillo County, if he's got a pretty good run on the East Side because of his affiliation with New Mexico State, he's going to have not such a bad time in Grant and Cantor County, I don't think, uh, because, because of, of, of Howie Morales and his huge organization down there. So I guess when I stop to think about it, naturally speaking, he does have a chance. Um, 
What does uh, what what is the impact? I mean, do you think the serious impact of this uh, early barrage of advertising by the governor? And is it really safe to say um, that that the journal's editorial impact has been so watered down, so sort of feathered away by its its irresponsibility that it doesn't have that much of an impact? That's interesting because. I, I can't tell for sure what's going to happen. Yeah. The only thing I know for sure is it's going to be turnout. If you look at all of those elements we just spoke about in the last gubernatorial election, the Democrats won all those areas we were talking about. But because our numbers were so low, the governor's race of four years ago had the lowest turnout in over 20 years. And most of that lost turnout was Democratic turnout. And so... If we have a low turnout, we again will win all those areas of the state, but we'll win them by such low margins that we can't make up for what's going to happen in the Republican areas. So, so that's the question. And then there's this conflicting thought. One is that the governor is using all this early money, which she has gobs and gobs and gobs of early money, to do a knockout punch. And that... that King has to respond. And whether or not he can or not, with the limited amount of money the Democrats have, is, is a real question mark. But the other part of that spectrum is nobody watches these races until after Labor Day. So all this is, could be really wasted money. And let me give you an example. Four years ago, the Democratic candidate was way ahead of the Republicans all through the early part of the year. It was only after uh, the summer that when people started watching and that um, all that national money came in, that Susanna was able to win. So I'm not sure if um, what's going to happen. Now, the other factor involved in all of this is Susanna Martinez is the incumbent. And the incumbent has huge benefits in New Mexico. The only one time has an a incumbent governor in my lifetime lost for re-election, and that was Bruce King against Gary Johnson. Right. And so with all of those built-in benefits, naturally you would think the governor has the advantage. But we are in this unprecedented economic freefall, and that may be a game-changer. I just don't know. So we know that, that there's uh, some v very tight races in the House. Uh, I'm pretty sure... I, Correct me if I'm wrong. That that the Senate Democrats are not going to lose control, but there's a but there's such a small margin. I believe it's about four seats in the House that that we could possibly lose. Uh, what would happen? Do you think? I mean, what's the mechanism? Of what would happen in the next two years if uh, this this governor is reelected and she gets the House but not the Senate? Uh, there'll be a couple of issues that will suffer mightily if. Uh, we lose the House. One is the environmental laws. They will try to eviscerate all the environmental laws. The money that's propping up the Republican Party in New Mexico now is mostly oil and gas money, over, predominantly from out of state. New Mexico is being viewed as a colony, and while they, they, they really want to do to New Mexico environmentally, which they can't even do in Texas and some of the other oil and gas producing states. So that once they own the ability to, to control the Environment Department and that there's no pushback from a legislative body, then they can really go to town on New Mexico water, and that is a huge problem. The next question will be water itself. Right. And what this governor did the last year was totally upset all the planning that we had put into all the major water projects in terms of their viability, in terms of their costs, in terms of their importance. And she put together her own very politicized list and she wanted $120 million of politicized water projects that I can tell you local communities in New Mexico said those projects weren't even their first priority. But she was doing that to say that she would be a good water governor. Well, if we carry on with more of these water type shenanigans, then we're going to lose our ability to um, produce enough water for this state. And, and 
And we have to realize that we're at risk already with our Rio Grande water. But just as importantly, we're very much at risk with our Colorado River water yeah. that actually feeds into Albuquerque um, through the tunneling project, which we did in the 1950s. The Colorado River is drying up dramatically. Yeah. That's the same river that feeds Arizona, Tucson, and their cotton fields, ironically, and California. Yeah. And how can the state of New Mexico withstand um, cases against Colorado, Nevada, and uh, Arizona, and California for the same water? Yeah. Um, the water is being over overused right now, but in those years where there was extra water, you know, those kinds of issues could be smoothed over. Now that there's not enough water, these issues can't be smoothed over. And we're in a death fight with the state of Texas over New Mexico um, Rio Grande water right now. Right. The lower Rio Grande water basin is at great risk right now to the claims being made by the state of Texas on this water. And if the state of Texas wins, and this case is in the Supreme Court right now, and if this, if Texas wins, that's going to decimate the lower Rio Grande water yes, supply. It is. it is. And all those farmers. And the farmers and the city of Las Cruces especially. For all of us who are concerned uh, with the future of our state, this election really does prove to be pivotal uh, for the next four or five or even six or seven years. And we should have them to lose that big case with Texas, which will take a long time to wind its way through the courts. Uh, and there, there does seem to be a chance that we would because of certain mismanagements and other things that we've practiced over the years. Uh, the, the, the whole of southern New Mexico's ranching and farming and dairy industry would be in, in terrible peril. So I guess, I guess what we are saying is, is that this is election for every Democrat and everybody who is who's a thinking person in this state to take seriously, to read about, to learn about, to go to the League of Women Voters or whatever they have to do and vote, for God's sakes. You know, it's, so to sort of try to make a little, a little s s segue here, we, um, uh, there are two really crucial issues uh, that, that, the, um, that the Mercury's been following. Uh, one is uh, the criminal justice system and how it's been activated here in Albuquerque, which you've already touched on, and, uh, and our jail systems and our county jails and the system. And the other is, is um, economic development in New Mexico as it, as it is uh, stimulated by uh, our intellectual upper hand, which I do think we have. We have uh, more PhDs here per capita, because we all know than any other almost any other state, I think. You have been a longtime supporter and a longtime follower of the University of New Mexico. It's in your districts. Uh, you've been the champion of all kinds of projects. You've been building projects, capital projects. What do you think, where is the university going now? What kind of a role can it hope to play in our economic development? What does the governor's office have to do with the activation of the university into using its brain power to help us survive this terrible, terrible recession, uh, which has even now gone on for what, uh, eight years, nine years? Well, the irony about the position of the university vis-a-vis -vis the economy is that higher ed in New Mexico during the recession disproportionately was cut deeper than any other segment of the New Mexico budget. And in fact, to give you the idea how bad it is, we're still, UNM, by we I mean UNM, are still $60 million less in funding than we were in 2008. No kidding. Oh so God. that the university has been handcuffed in its ability to really not just fulfill its academic mission, but to really fulfill its ability to lead the state and its intellectual brain power and, and to combine with the laboratories um, to really move New Mexico ahead as a center for excellence in um, in the areas which we had 
originally been making a mark in uh, telemedicine, for instance, and our medical school was doing incredibly interesting things about uh, primary care, uh, health, uh, not just in its hospital, but also in all of the rural areas of New Mexico. Right. And yet all of that is being starved for funding when, at the very time New Mexicans have a better opportunity for health care than they've had in, in our lifetimes, that we can now convert New Mexico into a place where everybody could afford health care, but there aren't the doctors. We're something like 400 doctors down, 400 dentists down, mm -hmm. and yet UNM has not been given the funds to really create the kind of medical community that needs to be done. And let me give you a for instance. You go into Montgomery, Alabama, and their medical school is blocks and blocks and blocks long. And in fact, it's a center in the South for medicine. And it's the university hospital that does it. And if you look at the gross receipts that are collected in New Mexico, a huge percentage of those gross receipts deal with things having to do with the medical school. Sure. Yet, the medical school is being starved. And so we can't perform the function we need. And think about other things. If the University of New Mexico had the funding, maybe we could work with the oil and gas industry on water issues to make sure that we examine and discover new methods of preserving our water that's being affected by drilling. And if we can do that, we could be the, a leader in the nation. Sure. And we have one of, the irony about it is, our, in our engineering department, we have one of the best chemical engineering departments in the Southwest, and its emphasis is on water, clean water. And that's exactly what could be happening if we could tie our chemical engineering department with our oil and gas industry, it would move this state ahead immeasurably in environmental and, and fracking regulations and, and, and oversight. But we can't do that. We just can't do it. Um, then, you know, you take the Anderson School, you take our, our traditional great gems in our anthropology department, and, and look at all the things they've made a name for UNM internationally. And, and it's just being nickeled and dimed to death when you look at the professors we're losing. And, and so, you know, my daughter is 18 years old. She's graduated from Albuquerque High School this year. And she was going to universities. And I won't name names, but we were being courted by a university in the East Coast. She was accepted to every private institution she applied to. That's, that's the quality of education she got in our public schools, by the way, which I'm worried is faltering. Yeah. I listen to the teachers and they tell me. But um, at this private institution, we had the provost telling us that they have hired 500 new tenure-track faculty, full-time faculty, in the last six years. And that's at a university that has a lower uh, student body than New Mexico. How many full-time tenure-track professors has UNM been able to hire? Virtually none. And in fact, I was told by one student that he attended a, a recent um, regents meeting and the regents produced a, a budget that the president had to follow, which actually meant that the costs of added costs of retirement contributions and health care contributions were going to mean a decrease in the take-home pay of professors. And the region actually said, I want it to hurt, and I hope they feel it, and I hope they know it's going to hurt. That's not a way to, to entice the brightest in the world to come to New Mexico. That's no way to do that. And so... When you're $60 million behind in the budget that this governor wants us to have, there's no way that's ever going to get corrected. Well, actually, you know, we never read that in the journal, did we? Um, the um, Many organizational experts uh, will say, you know, that the leadership is everything. You change the guy at the top, you, you, you decapitate 
the Inca Empire and it goes away, you decapitate the Aztec Empire, it goes away, you change the governor and things change. Maybe for the worse, maybe for the better, but they change. Uh, you keep you keep the same person there and it's the same thing. You're not going to see any change. So um, this, uh, the, uh, the thought that our major assets are being underemployed to help us, our cultural assets, our scientific assets, our general intellectual assets, uh, uh, and we and we have and we all know how hard it is, how, how hard it is to make a go of anything in New Mexico these days. Just very very difficult. There's no disposable income to speak of anymore. Everybody's so beaten down and so on. Uh, it would seem clear that it's at some point a, a change in the brains might have an impact on helping that, uh, helping that lift. So here's the, here's the other question. I know that you have been for a long, long time uh, very concerned about uh, the criminal justice system in New Mexico. I know you've watched it and have examined it. I know that there's some, something going on I'm not sure exactly what it is, but there's a chance that we might actually rewrite our criminal code. Um, could you describe this a little bit and tell us what it's about and when it might actually come into play and what the implications of it are? Yeah, I'll be happy to, Vivi. Starting in 1979, the state of New Mexico did a hard right turn as it relates to the criminal justice system. And we went from a system, a traditional criminal justice system that had been in existence all throughout the United States, from one that was centered around elected judges deciding, and juries deciding the fates of defendants, to district attorneys through harsh sentencing and through techniques that were then given to district attorneys and, um, and issues about search and seizure that were given by the U.S. Supreme Court to police to totally tip the balance in favor of um, the district attorneys in prosecuting the criminal defendants. And the irony about this is this was all part of the law and order, tough on crime, lock them up and throw away the key mentality that started with Richard Nixon, but got started in New Mexico in 1979 when the sentencing laws were changed here. And ironically, what happened was that for uh, starting in the early 70s with Nixon and then going through the 1990s, all of the elements that cause crime, namely large young populations, grew and the crime rates grew. It had to do with the crack uh, epidemic in the inner cities and the drug epidemics, but it had to do with a lot of other things too. And none of the hard right solutions of lock them up and throw away the key solved anything. And then in the 1990s, as the youth population started to decrease, um, crime started to go down. And so now what we have are the remnants of this prison building and locking them up, people up and throwing away the key so that we now have the largest population of virtually any country in the world. The highest percentage of, of people that have been affected by the criminal justice system. Half of all young black Americans have in some way been connected to the justice system in America. For relatively petty things, but which, once you have the record, and um, it just doesn't go away. But what's been happening corresponding is two things. One is there's an incredible increase in the scientific community and our ability to catch criminals. And I was the father of DNA in New Mexico, and I learned about it through my time living in South America and what DNA did to uh, find and identify the remains of people that had been um, taken by the military in Argentina. And then we can apply all those same things, and we are applying all those same things to crime. And we are catching people at a rate that we were never able to do before through scientific method. 
But at the same time, we have these out of control costs for criminal justice. Let me give you, a, for instance, in New Mexico. Do you know we have the highest percentage of uh, incarcerated people in private prisons in the nation? And you know the other fact that's interesting with that is we have the highest costs of private prisons in the nation. So this whole idea that privatization of prisons, that we would reward people for locking away other people, would actually be cheaper it's proved to be just the opposite. 100% of our women in our women's prison are in a private prison, which they now want to expand. So what's been happening throughout the rest of the nation over the last 10 years, and the irony about it, it's been happening in the red states predominantly that are looking at the costs that they're incurring. They've decided this is nuts, and they want to change the whole mentality of criminal justice in America. And what they've been able to do is dramatic. In Texas, they have closed three prisons. In South Dakota, they wrote, rewrote their criminal code and in the first year saved $42 million. And the other thing that you should know about these two facts is in both of those states, crime went down. So that we know there are other solutions and they deal with the traditional issues of mental health, dealing with those that are mentally ill, dealing with those whose mental illness manifests itself in drug addiction. Because when you have people who are drug addicted, what you have are people stealing, shoplifting, burglarizing, all trying to feed their habit. And in each one of those cases, you have victims. And until we can go to the root of what's causing these crimes with victims, we're not going to solve our criminal justice problem. So how do you do it? What these other states, these red states are finding is that we have to deal with mental health issues. We have to deal with what's causing addiction and how, and, and in fact, there's new ways all through the last 20 years of how you deal with addiction that have been successful. We just need to implement those uh, more and more. And the way I, I like to encapsulate it is the idea that we're taking public health issues and trying to solve them in a, a, a criminal justice system. You can't solve public health issues in a criminal justice system. You need to solve criminal or you need to solve public health issues by public health solutions. And if we would do that, we would, we would lower crime. We would lower the number of victims. And uh, let's do an easy example, DWI. We have now 700 people in our prisons solely on DW, DWI convictions. 700. We've had to build a whole new prison in New Mexico to deal with it. Yet, we have not been able to find statistics provided by our um, corrections department that shows that the incarceration of people who have DWIs is actually preventing further DWIs when they're released. And the main thing all New Mexicans ought to know is, not just in DWI, 96% of all our criminals that go into our criminal justice system eventually get out. And do you want those people creating another crime and victimizing more New Mexicans? Or do we want to solve the issues that put them there in the first place? Other states are leading the way on how to do it. And in New Mexico, we also have an opportunity. We now have a subcommittee. And, and, and this is how important this subcommittee is. There, we are taking the politics out of it. For the first time in recent history, the state of New Mexico has created a legislative body that is equally numbered of Democrats and Republicans, and that has a Republican co-chair. Even though we are the majority They'd never do this in Congress in this House members right now. They'd never let a Democrat run a committee. But we are. We want that. We want this to be a bipartisan subcommittee trying to create 
fact-based solutions to public health issues and criminal justice issues to make New Mexicans safer and to save New Mexicans money. A number of years ago, the New Mexico Historical Review, which is a great publication, ran an essay on uh, recidivism in New Mexico during World War I and World War II. Uh, recidivism in New Mexico was reduced, I believe, to one and a half to two percent during those wars. Uh, the historian um, analyzed why that happened. And it was because uh, during the wars, the prison system was geared up to not only produce uh, war-related materials, but to educate people and to teach them to read and to give them job skills. And when people were released, the corrections department uh, had jobs for people, not necessarily military jobs either. Uh, so after each of those wars, however, a, a view appeared, which was we're just coddling prisoners. So let's cut that stuff out. Let's don't do any rehab anymore. And recidivism popped right back up to 25, 30%. I don't know where it is now. It's over 50%. It's over 50% now. Well, there's just no excuse for that. And it's, uh, so does the, does uh, redoing the criminal code also redo uh, the, the draconian penalties laid on, on uh, unconvicted felons, which, which almost, almost prevents them from getting any work at all, uh, and certainly prevents them from voting and, and all kinds of other things. What, what do you think some of the nuts and bolts of, of redoing uh, the, uh, the criminal justice system in the Mexican entail? Well, the major factors will be sentencing, yes, absolutely. We're going to try to make a sentence fit the crime, make sure that the sentence is tailored to the problems that, that we find in that individual to make sure he doesn't commit other crimes. Streamlining the system itself, streamlining the court system, streamlining how witnesses are called to testify and how witnesses are prepped in preparing to testify because we're finding that eyewitness testimony isn't really good. Trying to make sure that all the scientific evidence is laid out on the table early in a deliberation so that if a defendant sees the, how weak their case is based on the evidence and they know that they're guilty, maybe we can get a, um, a, a case um, taken care of quicker. But if the district attorney sees all the the physical evidence to before they try to make the plea bargain deals, um, before all the work is being done, then we'll get a just result. So there's there's uh, criminal justice procedures within the courts, there's procedures within the sentencing, there's procedures within the um, corrections department, all of which will try to reduce recidivism in New Mexico and Basically, what we need to do is we need to take the lessons learned by some of the most conservative states in the nation, f figure out what facts apply in New Mexico, creating a fact-based system, and make sure that that fact-based system works for New Mexicans. Well, we'd sure like to talk with you about this particular uh, and apparently fairly arcane matter, but it is so important. It is so important to the mental health, the family health, the community health, of all of our people, um, many of whom are hideously, in, unjustly um, deposited in what really amounts to useless dungeons, uh, which harm them horribly. Um, it's been great to talk with you. I hope we get to do it again. Uh, I, I look forward to cheering you on in the future, and thank you so much. Thank you, Vivi. It's really wonderful to be here. It's an honor.